Okay, welcome everyone to the latest in our short talk series. Uh, today, I'm talking to an inspiring young leader called Laura Davis, and it's really to find out more about her career to date and get some hints and tips for those Generation Z workers out there at the moment who might be leaving school, college or university and looking to go into the current job market in what is a really tough time. I know from businesses I've spoken to with apprenticeship schemes being pulled back, graduate schemes being um, cancelled or delayed, it's, it's a bleak time at the moment for those leaving school or leaving college or university and looking at what lays ahead. Laura stood out to me as someone who's had um, has achieved a lot in a short time since leaving university. And I wanted to talk to her today about um, some advice she might have. Now, Laura currently works as a, let me get this right, an aerodynamics design engineer for Red Bull Formula One and um, has already achieved quite a lot in a, in a few years since leaving uni. So, um, yeah, so Laura, first off, could you just, for the benefit of the audience, give us a quick overview on your career to date? Yeah, sure. Um, so I started off doing a national diploma in aerospace engineering after I finished my GCSEs. Um, that was obviously quite specific and I didn't take A-levels because there are other options. Um, I then went on to university and did aeronautics. Whilst I was at university, I joined an officer training corps, which is a reserves unit for students in the military. Whilst I was there, I learned a lot, got a lot of transferable leadership qualifications and adventure training qualifications. I transferred into the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers whilst I was at university and got a placement on the Bloodhound project what, between my second and third year of university, which really made my CV stand out when I left university. I was scouted for um, a position within the 35th America's Cup within the systems development team, um, which is Ben Ainsley Racing. Uh, from there, I went to Rolls-Royce for, for about seven months. It wasn't really an industry that, um, that drove me. So I started looking for more fast-paced innovative projects in which I was scouted for Dyson whilst I was at Rolls-Royce. Um, I worked on the electric vehicle for around two years. Um, I worked in the vehicle integration team and dotted about in body structures and vehicle engineering. Then obviously got made redundant last year and thought I'd apply for Formula One. Um, and here I am at Red Bull. That's a lot in, in four or five years. And I, I know when we spoke briefly before the interview, what was quite interesting was the, the military aspect. And that was at your time at university of getting involved in that. So could you tell us just a little bit more about how you, you got into that and, and the effect it's had on you? Yeah, sure. So I credit the military or the reserves for being a huge help with regards to my career. Whilst I was at university, um, I joined the officer training corps. There's a reserves unit for the army, the navy and the RAF. So you can join either one. They've got a selection process. And usually if you've got a bit of confidence, a bit about you, you'll get through. Mm -hmm. So I did that for two years where you, you just do basic soldiering and officer training. And I transferred early because I knew that with doing aeronautics, um, going into the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, I'd get some hands-on skills and, and get a trade. So I chose to be a soldier and didn't continue down the officer route because um, officers are essentially the managers and soldiers do all, all the work hands-on. So in the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, um, they were linked to the Bloodhound. The government gives subsidised recruits to work on the Bloodhound project, which is the land speed record car. Um, which is obviously excellent. And whilst I was in the Remi, I also did um, a trade as a vehicle mechanic, so fixing Land Rovers and um, man vehicles. So it's it's really it's really hands on. It's a, it's a really good thing to do, especially for me. And it also helped when I went to Dyson. Kind of knew a lot about the um, the, the the internal parts of a car because I built them by hand. So it aided my career that way um, with regards to having that hands on knowledge as well as the um, theoretical point of view as an engineer um, which is really quite rare so it was a huge help with my career but also the transferable skills that you learn as well so I, I got a leadership qualification from the Chartered Management Institute level five certification so that obviously looks really good on your CV you also go through some um, dire situations whilst in training and it it builds your confidence and um, I definitely built a different work ethic um, having been through the military. And it's really odd to see people that don't follow the same work ethic that haven't had any interaction with the military. Um, yes, it's so, it's so different. Um, and I think people appreciate sometimes my 
I can come across quite brutal, quite forceful, but it gets the job done and mm. people appreciate that, I think. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> it's, that's a trait I've spoken to a lot of leaders over the last few weeks in doing this series and that get the job done focus has been a key part of it. And it's interesting how just that um, chance switch onto the reserves at university and getting involved with that led to Bloodhound, um, which gave you the automotive experience then into, into Dyson or, and, and Ben Ainsley, then Dyson. And that theme that's got you to where you are now. Just for the benefit of people listening, could you just tell, say a little bit more about what Bloodhound is and what, what your involvement was with that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I actually got picked up for it via uh, Twitter. I used to post things or still do post things on Twitter about military and my career. I was doing it whilst I was at university. So one of the um, officers that was leading the Bloodhound project from the military side um, saw me posting and offered me to become a STEM ambassador at the time. Um, so I did the course to become a STEM ambassador and started attending um, Bloodhound events. So the Bloodhound is a project to make the land speed record car, but it's also got an educational team that go around the country uh, into schools and to, to, to events. And they do um, they do shows or they do um, education type events where they'll build rocket cars and they'll teach children about the aerodynamics of the car. It's all kind of linked to the car or the, um, or the education. So I did that. Um, for a few months and then um whilst i was off university between second and third year they offered me a chance to go and work there um during the summer so just odd bits and bobs because i was still at university so um did a bit of design work on the computer some simple stuff and then did a bit of work in the workshop um bending metal and making brackets for things inside the car so it was a really really good opportunity <laughs> and what what speeds the, the car aiming for because this is basically it's like a fighter jet on wheels isn't it really Pretty much. <laughs> um, it's aiming for a thousand miles per hour. Wow. <laughs> They've done some really good tests recently. Um, yeah. Husky and Pan, um, which is in South Africa. Wow. And when's the next, um, when are they going for the next record, do you think? No idea. Uh, the project kind of slowed down due to funding mm -hmm. um, after I left the project. Um, so someone bought it last year and they restarted it up. The education team kept the thing going whilst it was between um, between hands, and I think they're just they're just continuing um, to go as fast as they can. So the fact that they got it to Husky and Pan and they got the first test done is, is really um, it's really promising. Yeah. So how did you go from there to working on America's Cup yachts? Because I think from what I've seen with the latest yachts, they're they're amazing pieces of equipment. I mean, they don't even look like boats anymore. Um, how did you get into that? I had no idea that the America's Cup existed. Um, I literally got a phone call. I was quite smart um, before I left university and I was putting my CV online everywhere. And with having the Bloodhound on it and having the military on it, um, it stood out quite a lot for someone coming out of university. So I think the aim for the, the, aim for the America's Cup, um, especially at Ben Ainsley at that time, they were, they were recruiting quite a few um, graduates. Obviously, young people, new ideas, and were also quite cheap. So um, I think I, I stood out um, as a student coming out of university. I got a phone call and obviously got the job. And I imagine the science in use there is, is the same as Formula One. It's, it's absolute peak performance of everything, the materials and the design and... Uh, yeah, definitely. So I actually worked with many um, ex Formula One uh, engineers, which is essentially how I got into Formula One. Um, one person that worked in systems recommended that I go to Formula One after I I was on a six month contract. So he said, when you leave, look to go to Formula One because you'll really enjoy it there. Because mm. having worked on the Bloodhound, it was a really fast paced project, as in the engineering was cutting edge and they were doing things and testing it um, at a really fast pace. Um, I guess you've only got one person's life um, at risk within um, the Bloodhound project, so you don't have to go through all these uh, legislations and um, everything that you would do in like normal aviation, for example. Mm. Uh, so it's it's really it's really fast paced engineering, really because the edge. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very similar to Formula One. It's like the Formula One of yachting. So when you were doing an aeronautics degree five, six years ago, did you ever envisage ending up at this point now working in Formula One? No. Um, to be absolutely honest, um, my aeronautics uh, degree, we had modules um, that we shared with motorsports 
and we'd sometimes be learning about the aerodynamics of a car instead of an aircraft and obviously aero kicked up a fuss about it I was like, I don't want to learn about cars I'm not interested in cars <laughs> and funnily enough I ended up working in automotive and now in Formula One <laughs> That's fantastic. And I, I think what's really interesting on this is just, again, how the chain of events has happened from uni to military to getting picked up, as you say, from a tweet, from your um, Twitter activity to Bloodhound, from the interest of that, to then stand out. And also your activity at university, as you said, getting your CV out everywhere, that being really yeah. active, whether it's active on social, getting my CV out, you will get noticed and then get picked up with the Bloodhound experience and then America's Cup experience. I mean, that would be amazing. And then, as you say, from your contacts through Ben Ainsley, getting into Formula One. So in that short space of time, it's a really interesting chain of events. Yes, yeah, really interesting. Funnily um, enough, um, when I was when I was had a phone call from Dyson asking if I wanted to join the secret project, which wasn't that secret if you Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was the same recruiter that actually recruited me to Ben Ainsley Racing. He just joined Dyson as a recruiter and he thought, I'll ring Laura. Yeah. And fortunately, I was looking for a, for a job at that time whilst I was at Rolls Royce. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> what, what stands out to me is you, you've been really active throughout. You've made loads of contacts. You've committed yourself for each stage and you've taken the opportunities when they've come up, which is really interesting. It's really good. Take um, every opportunity. Yeah. And, I am. Um, when I left Ben Ainsley Racing, I, I didn't know how to sail whilst I was there. I didn't know um, that much about sailing at all and the sport in general. So I decided to learn how to sail and put myself on a transatlantic crossing. Right. So, <laughs> so I, did, I did that and got my competent crew and I've been sailing with the Army Offshore sailing team for a couple of years. So. <laughs> how was that as an experience? What was that like? Sailing the Atlantic. Um, it was like being in purgatory. <laughs> 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 yeah, it was really fun. Um, Super fun. We went the trade winds way. We went from Lanzarote to the Caribbean. Um, but there wasn't there wasn't much wind at all, so we must have motored quite 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 far. Um, but it was super fun, and um, we uh, we stopped the boat um, at the deepest part of the Atlantic Ocean and got one of the halyards and put a fender on the end and swung off the boat um, into the ocean. So that was that was super fun and a once in a lifetime thing. Wow. <laughs> um, I had a question for you about um, what drives you. So tell me a bit about what really drives you. Um, so I think I, I like to keep myself busy. I get bored um, and obviously engineering. I, I, I never actually envisaged myself being an engineer when I was growing up. I wanted to be a vet. Um, All right. So it was off the cuff that I decided that I wanted to do aerospace engineering at college. I thought I need to challenge myself or else I could get bored. So I just, I took that route and found out I was quite good at it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess the drive comes from the challenge because I really, I really love to be challenged. And I'm always looking for new opportunities or looking for holes and things to try and improve things. So that's the kind of thing that drives me. <laughs> And what about with the, the military training you've done when you, I guess, up to your eyeballs in mud and it's freezing cold and you're out in exercises? What about that? What keeps you going with that? Um, I don't actually know. <laughs> so I guess because you're you're there, you're not on your own. You're mm -hmm. part of a team and you don't want to let your team down. So that's the drive for me there. Uh, you don't want to be that one person that's making the rest of the team fail and you want you want to help everyone and you want to shine so that's what drives me within a military setting it's fascinating you say that because the last person i interviewed was sarah donahue who was an offshore powerboat racer who fought her way back from a, a, a really bad <laughs> crash um and when i asked her about motivation she said the same thing i want to be back for my team i don't want to let my team down and even when she got back into a boat two years after nearly dying um she said yeah i wasn't going to show any fear because i wasn't going to let the team down so it's interesting it's interesting you mentioned that um what about role <laughs> models now i know when i first we spoke about this he said oh, i'm not sure i'm not sure but there must be someone who's had an influence on you to date whether it's a lecturer teacher or, or someone is is there anyone who you think has helped shape that your character and motivation to date um I guess there is one person, I don't remember their name, uh, full of no money, but it was more of a negative influence than a positive. Also, was at college, we had a stand-in lecturer, and I think um, I was the only person or the only woman in 
in that college in um, the Eurospace uh, training center in Macclesfield. And I was the only girl in the course, the only girl in the building. I'd sometimes have to be um, chaperoned um, during my one-to-ones, um, which was really weird. Anyway, this um, lecturer, he refused to answer a, a question that was asked. I asked him to repeat something. And he basically said, you're a woman, you won't be an engineer anyway. So that was mm. definitely a driving force for me. Um, not with regards to role models, but someone that definitely put it in my mind to succeed. Yeah, and, and I guess that that it's, it's an important point. You can have positive and negative influences that will drive you like that. Um, so, okay, no, that's really interesting. And, and again, as the father of two daughters, uh, two teenage girls, it, it's 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 good to hear how you've you've I guess you've taken that and you've turned it around and you've you've made it I guess. A driver for you because I guess another bit I see you were voted one of the top was it 100 most influential women in engineering so from a lecturer who said you'll never make it in engineering you're now one of the top 100 most influential women so tell me a little bit about that that process and that award um, and I was actually involved. nominated and um I I wasn't given uh the name of who nominated me so it was really kind of them to do so um so I had to fill out a bio and name all the outreach stuff I'd done, my career to date. And they had a board from the inclusive boards, sort of sift through the applications and the bios uh, and just yeah, pick out the top 100, I guess. So I was one of them, which I'm, I'm overwhelmed by. <laughs> oh, it's great. So there's a good point for everyone watching. If someone tells you you can't do something, <laughs> go and prove them wrong in the best possible way. <laughs> no, it's really good. It's really good. So, um, any lessons you've learned so far, you'd say? Um, yes. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I'm having to think about this one. Um, there's some positives I've taken, and there's obviously some negatives. Um, I get asked quite frequently about being a minority in the workplace and how men are around women and how women are around men. And I find that just being yourself um, is the best thing and try not to take offence at things because men will be men and women will be women. And generally, men are actually quite quite scared of women being in the workplace because um, they have to they feel like they have to tiptoe around us sometimes um, with us being the minority, and they're maybe scared of us going to HR with with the very smallest um, complaint about a sentence that we don't like, and maybe relating it back to being a female. But um, I just I find that just being yourself and like I say, not taking offence to things is the best way to behave around those uh, situations. And, then, yeah. and do, you, do you think that comes from your military training and experience where you're in it, you're just all in it together to get on to the same Probably. goal, do you think? Um, it's quite, again, it's quite um, male dominated in the military and there's definitely some crude humour there and you learn not to take offence to it and you join in. Um, and also they kind of strip you of all your modesty in certain scenarios. So um, definitely mm. when you're out um, in the field on exercise. So you just kind of learn to not be a woman or a man. You just, you're just just a soldier. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's a great point. And I, sorry, I, I cut in a little bit before, but were there any other lessons you wanted um, to add? Yeah, definitely. Um, take every opportunity that you can. Um, I've definitely done that and it's benefited me so much that I thought I, I was quite shy when I was younger. I'm very shy. I'm quite withdrawn and didn't really believe in myself. But the more I achieve, the more I believe in myself. And for example, I'm terrified of heights. So I went and did a paragliding course and I now go solo flying. So um, just, wow. <laughs> just really push yourself <laughs> to your limits um, because you are a lot, a lot better than you think you are and you are definitely capable of, of whatever you want to achieve and again if you find that you're not comfortable doing those things or you struggle a little bit then that's a lesson learned for you and try something different so no great tips great tips and uh, I think what I wanted to wrap up with you was I said right your top three tips for those who may be studying right now and looking at figuring out their career steps and where to go next? Yeah, I guess the first one would be definitely look outside of degrees and A-levels. That's a pretty generic route. So I did a national diploma, which was quite specific, but there are other things you can do. You can even go into a company that offers 
um, apprenticeships or degrees whilst you learn. For example, Dyson have an institute where they do just that. So you get that experience in, in the workplace whilst learning and you also get a degree out of it. So um, there's lots of different ways to learn these days. And I'm seeing that some companies uh, take well, beginning to think about taking people into roles, graduate roles that don't have degrees um, as well as having degrees. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a lot more opportunities out there than, than the generic uh, A-levels and, and degree route. Um, I guess the second tip is if you are at university, I know that you want to have fun, but there are ways to have fun in which you're still learning and you're still developing yourself, which is what I did, which was the, the officer training core. So having something outside of your studies, um, which is fun, but also engaging and, and you still learn and you're still committed to something, it looks really good um, on your CV when you come out of university. Um, and I guess my third tip is just literally put yourself out there and do, um, or at least try everything. <laughs> well, it's, it's fantastic because you, you're, you're living proof of that. And that, that's a fascinating bit from doing a degree where you thought, I don't want to do anything <laughs> to do with cars. Um, to putting yourself out there with the military and the training that led to Bloodhound, which led to Ben Ainsley, America's Cup Racing, which uh, Dyson and now Formula One. So I think it's fascinating and it, it, it's, it's quite inspiring for me listening to you talk about this and, and the consistent themes. I mean, I've been jotting some notes at the moment, but things like, as you say, you've got your CV everywhere. You've got your CV out there right at uni, right from the start to get maximum coverage. You were active on yeah. social with the... Twitter stuff you were doing, which got you picked up. Um, and active on social, I guess, with the right stuff as well. Not, you know, I see a lot of rubbish out there, but obviously you were putting out some good quality content, which has got picked up. Um, and the really point, uh, really good point is someone tells you you can't do something, then go <laughs> prove them wrong. And you've done that in, in the best possible way. And it's really good. It's really inspiring to see that. And the push yourself, clearly, as you say, at uni, when you could have been out partying or sleeping most of the day you weren't you were out um you know soldiering being put into uncomfortable situations and learning and had, i guess gaining skills yeah. and being paid for it i might add as well i might add um, as well you know, we did party important. in the military quite hard yeah, <laughs> 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 yeah. but I, I think it's fascinating for me talking to you and, and understanding how i can see how it shaped career today and i mean i say career today we're only we're still early early stages, but you've achieved a huge amount in that time and it's really inspiring. And I'm hoping that if there's someone watching this and uh, maybe just finished uni, it was about to finish uni and thinking, what do I do? What are my options? I'm looking out at a, if I read the news that the, the, the job market doesn't look great, what's happening with um, the economy and I think some key lessons there, no matter what's happening out there, push yourself, take every opportunity get your CV, get your details out there, be active on social, get noticed yeah, and work hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, and lastly, just with, with your current role with, with F1, what kind of stuff are you doing? Just to give us a little bit of a taste of what, what a typical day might look like. <laughs> it's not all champagne and partying on my end, unfortunately. I work in the design office. <laughs> so, yeah. um, I'm an aerodynamics design engineer, as you said, so I sit within the model design team. So... That is sort of a hybrid role that I'm in. I've not been there too long, but um, what I do do is um, take surfaces and maybe resurface them um, for, for the aerodynamicists to run simulations on, or I will make wind tunnel model parts where I'll resurface parts and look at the modularity and uh, mechanical parts essentially to go on the aero tunnel, uh, wind tunnel model. Um, and then also, looking at pressure tap system for the wind tunnel model, um, just aligning that for, to all the new parts. So predominantly working with the wind tunnel model, which is 60% uh, of the real car size. And what's the pressure like in the role? I imagine Formula One being super high pressure, everything's good, you know, working around the clock and that vision of pit crews and, uh, but what, what's it like? What's as, the pressure like? as a design engineer, it's, um, it's like silent pressure because it's, it's how fast you're working yeah. on, on your computer, how fast you're designing something essentially. So yeah, it's, um, it's stressful in a sense where you've got really um, short time constraints um, with regards to what pieces need to be made and tested to go on cars for races. 
um, say there's a program that we align to with regards to what we test and when it needs to be done by to go on the car at a certain race. So if it's not done, then obviously the car doesn't get upgraded. So um, I don't know what's going to happen when we go back to work um, because obviously we don't know uh, where or when we're racing at the moment. So um, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> um what's next then where from a career path could could a job like this take you to um, next do you think i'm going to see how i fit in formula one first um maybe i want to stay and go up the ranks or maybe maybe i'll look for a small startup i realize that startups are a really good way to go because you learn a lot um there's varied roles within startups where you're not just working on a single um a single area of the engineering you're working um, through many different areas and you learn a lot uh, so I'm still in the process of learning really I've only been graduated for three and a half years four years coming up to you. so I, I still very much like learning and being technical Wow uh, it's been really inspiring today so for those of you watching with your degree there you have it I mean Laura's as you say three and a half years graduated served a soldier in the military um, worked on uh, land speed record car that's aiming to do a thousand miles an hour. America's Cup yachts worked on the designing of those. Uh, sailed the Atlantic with the military. Worked on Dyson electric cars, and now as a Red Bull Formula One aerodynamic design engineer. That's amazing, and it just shows from from that hard effort, that focus, uh, and putting yourself out there what you can achieve. So, thanks again to Leila. It's been really cool talking to you, really inspiring, and I hope others watching this might get. You know, it might give them that extra nudge or that edge to really push right, themselves. Thank so thanks again.